Okay. Hmm. Saying the stream's not super good, but we're gonna go with it and see what we get. <clears throat> All right, got a bunch of people already in the chat. We've got a good morning from the pocket dimension. I hope that everybody's doing well today. This is the new camera. It still needs a little bit of work here and there. When I booted it up this morning with all of the software, everything was completely dark and you could only just see like the most brightest parts. And then I had to do a bunch of tweaking to the software and it was a thing. But yeah, so it's, um. It's working out, I think, pretty well now. Still getting that over there. That's strange. I hope our internet's not all janky. Everything so far seems so good, though, but we'll see how it goes. Let me see. What have we got here? Besides the pocket dimension, we've got Stratford, Connecticut, South Jersey, Western France, the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, rainy Seattle, Israel. Um, let me see here. Colorado, the Urals. Portugal, Pensgrove, New Jersey, um, Austria, Kent, Belgium, Florida, Lafayette, Indiana, Stuttgart, Germany, UK, Oklahoma, Delaware, Waterford, New York, Chorley. Someone says, oh my god, I can see through time. I don't think that's actually true, Mr. Shruby. Um, what else have we got? Winnipeg, Wales, Cleveland, um, got a couple of Clevelands there, evidently Cleveland rules. I've not yet been. Kobe, Japan. Not freezing Texas. It's cold here, but it didn't snow, so that's a benefit, I guess. Topeka, Kansas. Little Rock, Arkansas. Connecticut. Japan. New Zealand. Um, Michigan. Costa Rica. Turin, Italy. Got England. Columbus, Budapest, or is it Budapest? Probably saying that wrong. Schaumburg, um, Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. That's a lot of fun to say. I enjoy the word Saskatchewan. Uh, audio, or audio, Ohio, uh, the, oh, Iowa, Halifax, Norfolk, Mexico, Singapore, uh, Cyprus, Northern Sweden, New Orleans. Snow everywhere in Ontario. That makes sense. I can't, I'm, for a while, you will catch me looking at where the camera used to be, which was about here. So there will be times I will look over here and then have to look over there. Um, Mark Pendel says, Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, neighbor. How is the Fox Valley? Chilly. It's like in the 20s, I think. Yeah, it's like 20 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. and um, But not really windy or anything, so that's good. Moderator Matt asks, so now your floating head will be in high def. Um, it's technically not in any higher of a definition than it's been in the past. I'm still outputting everything at 720p. Um, the trick is, is I am no longer using uh, a little webcam like this. I am instead using a big fancy interchangeable lens type camera. And then the HDMI output from that goes to a thing. I don't think this is the full box, but made by Elgato called a cam link and then you plug that HDMI into the USB 3 port on your machine and then your computer thinks that your big fancy camera is a webcam so you can get this nice kind of shallow depth of field back here where you know Nick is kind of out of focus and all that other kind of stuff and it's it's a clearer looking picture but it's actually not any higher resolution at least in this situation I could output at 1080 but then that would just be a uh, just more, you know, download for you guys, more uh, bandwidth we would have to go through and stuff like that. So I'm sticking at 720 for now, but we'll see how it goes. Um, Munich, Germany, Arcadia, Greece. Um, what else have we got? Poland, Norway, Scotland, blue skies and low sun, great light for painting. Yeah, that's not too bad. I could see that. Because I'm betting that it's probably uh, getting closer to sunset. So you get what's they called the golden hour. <clears throat> um, we've got Dartford, Kent. What else? Um, 
it's 20 degrees Celsius here and we are cold. 20 degrees Celsius to me is not particularly cold, especially not in November, late November. Moderator Matt says that is more detail than I ever wanted. I understand that. That's true. But other people who are maybe nerds like me, they might be interested in knowing some of the weird behind the scenes on how you make the sausage in this situation. But anyway, um, it looks a little bit more cinematic. I like the look of it. It can also, frankly, it can draw in a little bit more light because of the lens is like this big around instead of that big around. And um, so it kind of helps that way too. Let me see here. VJ Morph is referencing a conversation we had yesterday in the Patreon uh, monthly live chat. Adam, I picked up Four Against Darkness PDF just before. I had a quick look and watched a YouTube playthrough. Looks great. Thanks so much for the tip. So yesterday, um, VJ Morph was asking about some solo war games. And I gave him a couple of ones that I know of. And there's not a lot of them that I know of, sadly. I do know the new Fallout... Wasteland Warfare, I think, has a, maybe a, a, a what do you call it, a solo mode. I, I ended up getting a copy of it uh, given to me by the store in, um, actually, Madison, Pegasus Games out of Madison. Um, they said, hey, we'd like you to take a look at this. And, and uh, I was at a convention down in Madison, actually, last weekend, and uh, so they gave it to me. Um, the models are okay looking. And I don't really know a ton about the game. I kind of just read through some of the early kind of preliminary stuff. I think I watched maybe a battle report, or not a whole battle report, part of a battle report at one point. But um, yeah, it does evidently have a solo mode. So, um, But then there's another game called Four Against Darkness. Four Against Darkness is a book made by uh, Andrea Sfigoli, which I'm probably mispronouncing again. Um, He's the designer for uh, Song of Blades and Heroes. So I've talked about Song of Blades and Heroes before, I don't know how many times. And he uh, made this book, which actually is, again, it's a it's almost like a solo RPG. It's like a solo dungeon crawl. And um, it actually got really pretty highly rated for a while over at Board Game Geek, and it's kind of done pretty well for him. So I mentioned that, and, um, and VJ went and picked it up and looked at the PDF a bit. So... Uh, if you're looking for some sort of like solo RPG where you get to use some um, uh, graph paper and do some kind of cool stuff and like a random dungeon crawl sort of a thing, take a look at it. It's called Four Against Darkness. I think I actually picked up my copy from Amazon. Yeah, because that's right. I told the story yesterday. The first copy that I got, because they do print on demand at Amazon now, and I guess. Uh, but anyway, the book I got was mangled. Just the, I mean, it was like cheap. It was like 12 bucks, but the, the whole spine was just broken. So I did an RMA or whatever, all that stuff, and they sent me a new one, and that one was not uh, mangled. So there you go. Um, BJ Morph also says that the Blackstone Fortress game, you watched a playthrough, and you could play that solo too. I haven't watched any of the playthroughs for that one yet. Uh, I looked at some of the models. They look pretty cool. Um, they have a copy of it at my local shop. Um, Mark Pendle says, Pegasus Games, woot woot. Uh, hey, I'd like to hear your experience at GameholeCon. Did you meet Jared and Pete from Bolter Club? I did not, and I don't know what Bolter Club is, so that's going to be a problem. But uh, I'm being told that it's pronounced Sfiligoy. That makes probably more sense. Um, Pegasus, er, uh, GameholeCon was surprising. Uh, this was the sixth year, and I've been hearing about it for years because it's only about an hour and a half drive away. Uh... It is surprisingly large. It is big. Um, and it has grown quickly. So um, I just went on Saturday. We went, me and one of the guys from uh, from Game 4 went, cut to recon and check it out and see if it's something we want to start trying to work with them on and stuff. And I think we do, definitely. Um, it's mostly RPG, but there is some, there's some board game and there's some, some war gaming. The one thing I didn't see anywhere was... Um, collectible card games. I didn't see any Magic or Pokemon or any of the other ones. But there was um, board gaming and miniature gaming, but the majority, like I said, was RPG. And they had pulled in some big names. Um, Peter Atkinson was there. He's the Him and Richard Garfield are the ones that started uh, Wizards of the Coast. And Peter Atkinson then bought um, Gen Con eventually. And I don't know if he still owns it now, but um, yeah. That's been that he was there running games. He was there being a DM. Um, 
I bumped into Steve Jackson from like Steve Jackson games, like you know Munchkin and Car Wars and all that stuff. He was there as a guest. Um, there were some like folks like from Critical Role and stuff like that. Those types of shows there. Uh, Matt Mercer, I guess. Uh, I don't really know a lot about Critical Role. Uh, Satine Phoenix. She's a sort of famous kind of geek and sundry uh, RPG person. Um, <laughs> I told the story yesterday. I was standing at this booth learning about this new product from a company called Beetle and Grimm, and it's like a super high-end RPG, like, um, what do you call it? It's a super high-end uh, campaign pack. It's like $500, and they only make a 1,000 of them, and it's licensed through Games Workshop, or not Games Workshop, sorry, uh, through Wizards of the Coast, but it's designed for, you know, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. But it's got all this stuff in there, and it's just crazy, like all these trinkets and maps and clues and things you can hand out and all that stuff. And they do really nice work. And I was talking to the two guys at the booth, and then the third guy who was with them was not in the booth. He was out in the walkway, and he's wearing like a knit cap and glasses and stuff, and he's talking. And I'm like, why do I recognize this guy's voice? And then I, I, I realized it was Matthew Lillard. Now, if you don't know who Matthew Lillard is, he played Shaggy. In the Scooby-Doo movies, he played serial killer in the movie Hackers. Uh, he was in the uh, Wings Wing Commander movie. He was in uh, Scream. He was in some movie recently in the, in the, in Hawaii with George Clooney. Like he's a pretty uh, you know well-known uh, Hollywood actor, and he's friends with these guys, and probably an investor in their company because he said he was part of it. But he was just there hanging out, and I was kind of talking to him and didn't realize who it was at first. So. It was a very interesting uh, kind of convention for being a small thing in Madison, Wisconsin, but it's actually getting bigger. I would say it's probably three to 4,000 people. So yeah, that was a very cool convention. Uh, I'll be definitely going back again next year. Um, what else have we got? Alexander says, I'm more into tabletop RPG than wargaming. I'm preparing a Shadowrun session using some of the minis I'm painting. Used to play Shadowrun too. Um, actually, back in the day, in the mid '90s, when I lived with these two other guys, we played a lot of uh, Shadowrun, like on Sundays, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, J Tick says, "In the preview into this video, it showed you in an Irish cabbie hat. I'm not very happy. I was denied my Irish cabbie hat. Well, go watch yesterday's uh, Patreon uh, video because that's where that screenshot was from. I was wearing the, the hat yesterday. Um, I don't." have it anywhere near me right now so uh, and I just took a shower so my hair is all you know perfectly quaffed obviously um, yeah so uh, Mark says notice top of laptop screen visible at bottom of camera view intended for effect picture much better though this is actually not a laptop screen this is my monitor this is the LCD monitor my desktop is like right there um, I need to kind of get some things kind of figured out. I've got it on a tripod right now, the camera, and the tripod is as low as it goes. So I would either need to get it a little bit lower and then angle it up to get rid of this or something. Otherwise, if I angle a camera up, then there's just a bunch of extra space up here just so that you don't see this. But it's we're, we're getting there, um, indeed. Um, let me see here. VJ Morph says, hack the planet again. Indeed, I agree. I do... I know it's totally cheesy, but I do love the Hackers movie. Um, yeah. Uh, Paul Bateman says, anyone here from Bristol, UK, looking for a Necromunda group to play against? I would suggest, Paul, that you take a look at an app called Game4, and then you uh, load that on your phone, whether it's an Android or iOS, and then you can um, post that kind of stuff and hopefully find some people. I've gotten tons of messages from people who have found people to play with using the Game4 app. Um, you would probably be best using the looking for players section of the game for app so yeah blue g6 demon says that we don't talk about the wing commander movie i can understand that um sir says hey uncle adam how do i keep mold out of my wet palette um i've never had that issue so I don't know, but that being said, I have heard from several people that what they say to do is to put a couple of pennies. Now it depends on whether or not, like if you live in America, I don't, like if your pennies are different elsewhere, like in say the UK or whatever, I don't know. But if you're in America, I have been told to put some pennies in the in underneath the paper towel in the water there. And for some reason that's supposed to help, but that's the best tip that I've got. Because like I said, I've never run into mold, so. Yeah. 
Um, hmm. How many hours do you spend painting daily? Do you work anything related to the hobby? Thank you, you are amazing. Well, thank you very much. Um, how many hours do you spend painting daily? Uh, I wish I could paint every single day, but I don't. I try to paint as frequently as possible. Um, but other things like this or my day job and stuff like that get in the way. Um, I do generally like to if I can. Uh, like a perfect week is I'm at least able to paint a couple hours a day if I can pull that off. Um, but yeah. Let me see here. Bo Duke says, Peterborough, UK here. Got my first tournament this weekend at Warhammer World and a bit nervous. Shout out would be cool. Love the channel. Well, that's cool. I'm glad that there was a that you went to a, a, your first tournament. It's cool that your first tournament was at Warhammer World. That's pretty fancy. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Serena asks, I'm not sure if you're big on board games slash card games, but what are your thoughts on Keyforge? That's very interesting, Serena, because I actually picked up Keyforge on Friday, and I have the box, well, yeah, over here. I've moved my cards into a weird little case here, which is neat, because it opens up, it's got like magnets, and then it does that, and then I can put my cards in there, and then on the top, there's like, uh, you know, I like gadgets. Like this opens up, and I can keep all the, the tokens and junk in that little drawer up there. Um, it is, it's interesting. It's, so Keyforge, for those of you that don't know, and I'm not really a big card game player, especially like Magic and stuff like that, where you're constantly deck building. The thing that's cool about Keyforge is there's no deck building. All the decks are random, sort of. At least they're all different. And you get them, but you can't deck build, because when you get a deck of cards, you get them and they're all matched together, and the backs all match and they won't match another deck. So you can't just take a card out of this deck and put it into that deck because then the backs won't match. The back of each card has the name of your Archon, which is the name of your, your, your character or whatever. And so it's an interesting game because like the decks are all set. So if you don't like this deck, there's no way to go in and say, well, I'm going to go and put two more of these in and take these guys out or whatever. You just basically are like, well, I go buy another deck. And decks cost like 10 bucks. But it's... um. I don't know, I played a couple of games yesterday at the local shop, kind of getting my, my feet wet a little bit, and because um, they first announced it at Gen Con, and I talked to some guys about it, but I wasn't pull, planning on pulling the trigger, and then um, it just came out, and I was kind of interested, and I'm like, well, you know, because I've always been interested in card games, but I hate deck building for, for whatever reason, which, you know. Um, so this is kind of interesting to me, and I, I had some fun with it yesterday, so, um, I mean, I don't certainly this will not become a Keyforge channel, but I did enjoy the games that I played yesterday afternoon, so yeah. Um, let me see here. On the mold issue, uh, pennies are made of copper. Anything copper uh, will do like copper paper clips. I've never seen a copper paper clip, but yeah. Little pieces of copper, evidently. If they, if they help to fight mold, then, then that's awesome. Um... E1 Miniatures says, really nice camera quality. Well, thank you. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, it's a bigger, fancier, non-webcam camera, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, let me see here. What else have we got? Any recommendation on, uh, recommendation on how to fix fuzz slash hazing after using spray-on matte varnish? I have never had a frost issue with spray-on matte varnish, but I have been told or have read in many time, many situations, that if you do end up frosting a model, the way to save it is to then try to spray it with a gloss varnish, because then that will get rid of the frost, and then maybe you can try the matte varnish again. Um, the big deal with matte varnish is, A, don't try to use old matte varnish, because it, it will, like, like if we're talking about a can, because it will, it, it's more likely to do that. Also, don't do it when it's humid, um, there's a bunch of different, there's a bunch of different little, like matte varnish from a can is very tight uh, tolerances. Like you don't want to, like I will prime on a day when it's maybe too humid or too cold or whatever like that, but I will not fr uh, varnish with when it's sucky outside. If it's too humid, if it's too whatever, it's not something I'm going to do. Um, I did just pick up actually, and I haven't gotten a chance to use but I just picked up this stuff from AK Interactive, and it is called um, Ultra Matte Varnish. Um, 
like I ordered it and then two days later, Vince uh, Venturella did a video about it. So I haven't done a video about it, but you should go watch his video about it. He likes it a lot and I'm looking forward to it. You can brush it on or you can airbrush it on. So I'm looking forward to giving that a try because it's supposed to be even a little bit flatter than um, Tester's Dull Coat, which is my kind of go-to right now. The upside is, is that I can use this when it's winter outside because I just put it in my airbrush or even just put it on a paintbrush and put it on. Whereas with Tester's Dull Coat, if you're using the rattle can, you know, right now it's, like I said, it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside. I could not use it outside. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Cody, Lee's ask, Cody Lee asks, I like building and converting a lot, but painting feels like a chore sometimes. How do I keep it feeling fun? I made a video about if painting feels like a chore. I can't link to it, um, but I, I like because it's live. But um, yeah, there is definitely a video I did about it. Um, if it feels like a chore, then that's, that's kind of difficult. I, I think that to many people, the reason that painting can feel like a chore sometimes is because obviously they don't enjoy it. What I like to do then in that situation is I like to try to mix it with other things. I like to go, okay, cool. Well, I don't really enjoy the doing this, but I listen to this podcast or I listen to these audiobooks while I do it. The audiobook thing, I think, for me really helps because then, like, I don't want to just turn on the audiobook and sit in the living room and listen to it. I want to be doing something else while I'm doing it. So if I'm like, well, I might as well be painting while I'm trying to or building or whatever, that kind of stuff. Um, in some situations, if you really love building and converting, but you don't love painting, then maybe you want to talk to a friend who loves to paint but doesn't like to build and convert. And then the two of you work something out or you build and convert stuff. And then maybe you've got some commission painter, you know, where you're, you know, but there's there's things you can do. Um, but a lot of times the reason that people see painting as a chore is because, in my opinion, it's because they haven't done enough of it yet to get like where they want to be. You know what I mean? If you can kind of keep going to get where you want to be, then that'll be great. Um, so yeah, George says tabletop minions. It was the humidity that did me in, in refer reference to the the frosting. Um, yeah, that's if it's even kind of humid. I uh, like a lot of times the spray stuff, the spray um, varnish will say on the can like don't use it above this humidity or above this temperature or whatever like that. So that's actually important to listen to in those situations. But at this point, I would like say definitely try a gloss varnish and try to see if you can get that to go. Maybe do a little bit of research online. I'm, I'm, like I said, I've not had the problem before, but I know I've read that before, that some gloss varnish can help to take get rid of the, the, um, the frost and then go from there. It, worst comes to worst, you are going to have to probably strip it anyway. So if that makes it worse and you know throw it in some whatever your stripper of choice is and go to town from there. Uh, let me see here. David Peel, or Pyle, I may be pronouncing that wrong, says, I had good results with using Lamian Medium over frosted models. Yeah, I could see something like that too. Basically putting a clear coat, because what the frost is doing, how the frost happens, is it's like it's becoming kind of real bumpy. And so if you can kind of smooth out that bumpiness, like to make something matte, to make it do that, you actually have to make it bumpy anyway on a really small, not quite microscopic level, but on a very, very small level, you're making it bumpy. Uh, glossy is reflective and shiny because it is very, very smooth. It's like, you know, if you were to get, like, you, you know, when you used to go get, like, pictures, you, get, you used to get your pictures developed and they ask you, do you want glossy or matte? Well, if you got glossy, it was shiny and smooth. Um, a lot of laptop screens these days are glossy and shiny, which means you get a lot of reflection off of them. A matte surface um, or not reflective kind of like laptop screen, if you look at it really closely, it's bumpy, you know, because what happens is that the light comes down, hits those bumps, and then it gets ref refracted or reflected, whatever, off into different directions and not straight back at you. Mirrors are shiny. Um, mirrors are not matte finish because then it wouldn't work, but whereas brushed metal, it's got a lot of structures and a lot of stripes going in it, so that's why it's not reflective. So to fix the the kind of frostiness a lot of times putting something on it that's again glossy can kind of fill in all those little peaks and valleys those little peaks and valleys that's not fun um and go from there so um let me see here what do we get done um brian asks a hobby lobby just opened up five minutes from my house so I am likely going to get the same compressor you got from there using the coupon for my Iowa Eclipse. Thanks for the advice. 
yeah, I mean, I if you can use the coupon from the Hobby Lobby, it's like 40% off. That's a pretty good deal generally. Um, and I've been real happy with that compressor. It's a Sparmax, S-P-A-R-M-A-X or X-X, I'm not sure. Uh, and it's a TC2000, and it's a really nice compressor. Um, it's very quiet, does its job. Um, I haven't had any trouble with it, so yeah. Mine does not have a tank. Uh, my original one had a tank, and it was just like one that I got from the hardware store. It was bright red, you know, and it was crazy loud, scared the cats, and frequently me. Um, but yeah, the, a lot of airbrush tanks, like the, the high-end ones, actually don't have a tank or airbrush compressors don't have a tank because as you start to trigger it it will pulse and that seems to work pretty good for what I've got but it's up you know it's up to you the upside to having a tank connected is it will be totally silent for a while until the tank gets empty and then it will kick back in again now if it's a quiet compressor when it kicks back in again it won't be very loud if it's a you just get a compressor from the hardware store when it kicks in it'll be loud so um that can be um you know that can make you uh, startled. At least it makes me startled that way sometimes. Um, what else have we got over here? John Potter says, When I get bored of painting the same model again, I switch to a different style model or switch back to building a different model for a different army. Yeah, like I, what I have a tendency to do is if I have to paint a whole bunch of like matching soldiers of some, of some, some stripe, I will... At this point now, I can paint like 10 in a row. Like I will line them up on those paint sticks and put a little bit of putty in there. Or nowadays I'm using the little GW grippy handle things. So I've, and I've got a bunch of those. So I'll do anywhere from 5 to 10 models. And then just be like, okay, now I'm doing helmets. And then put that one down, helmet, put that one down, helmet, and whatever. And by the time I'm done with the last one, the first one's helmet is dry. And then I can go on to the next step. But if it's really boring or if there's some sort of problem, I either shrink that down to 5... And then I also work on five other models. So basically you go through this five and you do helmet, 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 helmet. And then you go to the next one and you do shoulder pad, shoulder pad, whatever. And then you kind of do that way. Um, it kind of is personal preference. These days I have a tendency, if I have a bunch of models to stick with, I would just work with them all at once and I don't need to alternate because I'm not getting bored with it particularly. But that is a way if you're tired of working on the same model. I mean, like if you're talking about a big army, yeah, that can get boring if you're talking about... 2,000 points of Space Marines and they're all blue or whatever, you know, or you've got, um, I don't know, uh, an entire, you know, Italian bolt action army or something like that. One of the reasons also that I'm um, really enjoying most uh, skirmish games, you know, like Kill Team and, and Wreckage and Malifo and anything like that where it's a small group is because then you just work on that small group and you're done. And then you can go work on a different small group and go from there. And then maybe switch to some terrain and then come back to doing more small groups or whatever. Chad Ashton says, can't use the coupon at Hobby Lobby on a compressor. Well, I did when I bought mine. Um, if the compressor is on sale, then they, you can't use the the coupon on something that's on sale. So they could be doing something like that. They may have may, they may have gotten smart and said, yeah, you if it's on sale, you know, like if it's on like 10% off, then you can't use a coupon on something that's on sale. So maybe they've done that. But when I bought mine, I got 40% off because it was like, I don't know, 350 bucks and I got 40% off. So yeah. Joshua asks, Uncle Adam, have you ever painted minis for board games, and which one did you enjoy painting the most? Have I ever painted any minis for board games? I don't think I have. Um, I mean, I know Sam has done a bunch of Zombicide. Uh, I've seen people do uh, Blood Rage, um, Shadows over or Shadows of Brimstone or whatever. I've seen some like some of those at conventions and things like that, but I've not actually painted any board game components because Lord knows I usually have enough regular wargaming ones to get done. Um, but no, I, I haven't. What else have we got over here? Sean Cavanaugh says, I'm painting my No One Wants to Work With Us Death Watch Kill Team, Flesh Terror, Minotaur, Son of Medusa, Raptor, and a Black Shield Flavor Country. Yeah, that does sound fun. I've got mine... Um, primed, and uh, they're going to be getting painted probably after I get some terrain done. Um, so yeah. Zachary Campbell asks, new camera? Yes, I did. That's 
new not uh, not webcam camera, so it um, it's got a little bit more of a thing going on there. Mr. Mendeleev, can you do drunk painting? Definitely less of a chore. Uh, or wait, no, you can do drunk painting. Definitely less of a chore, but the result may not be as good. Or if you need to develop some drunk monk abilities. Yeah, I've not... Um, I generally don't drink and paint, but that's just me. I, um... Yeah, maybe I should. <laughs> that's possible. DJ Todd P. Harris says, Do you sometimes get games just for the minis? I like the Rogue Trader and Black Fortress minis, but I don't want the games per se. Um... I generally don't go big like that because those are like $150 sets. So if there's like, if there's some models out of that that I want, I will frequently go to eBay. Like I wanted from the Betrayal at Kelf uh, box set, which was all Her Horace Heresy kind of 30, you know, 30K stuff. There was a bunch of different stuff in that box, but there was just a standard kind of like Space Marine 30K tech squad. It's like 10 guys. And I really wanted just those models. I didn't want the rest of the stuff in the box. So I went on to eBay and I think I got them for like 25 bucks. So I got like 10 models. And that's because it's Horus Heresy and before the Emperor's dead and all that stuff, there's not like skulls all over on everybody everywhere. And so I've used some of those models. Or I haven't, basically, I've used the parts. Like I like to think of, well, maybe this particular Space Marine that I'm building, he is super fancy, so he has a really old, like, 30K shoulder pad or really, you know, or, or older armor because he's been gifted with this older armor because he, it's, it's a relic or whatever, that kind of stuff. So I've used some of that kind of stuff before from that set. Um, but otherwise, no, I've never bought an entire big box set just because I want some of the models. I'll go on eBay and then pay less if I can. Um, let me see. What else have we got? Michael Strange says, I was painting Thousand Sun Rubric Marines last night while enjoying uh, Balvenie Doublewood. Oh, that sounds fancy. Um, I do eventually want to get Rubric Marines for, for, for Kill Team. Uh, it'll be a while, but I do want to do it. Diego Flores says, Uncle Adam, any suggestions for someone who has got bored of metagaming creeping into 40k? I am currently playing Horus Heresy because of that problem in the local store. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would, partially, it's uh, trying to find a different group of people to play with, sort of changing the meta, if you will. That's not always easy for everybody, obviously. The other thing is to sometimes change the game, which you've done here in this situation. Switching over to Horus Heresy is changing that. I also... I've, well, I don't know if maybe the game's too new still to have much in the way of metagaming, at least in my local area. But, you know, Kill Team it has been a lot of fun that way because there hasn't been as much of that kind of metagaming stuff that I've seen. But yeah, that's, that's kind of the way I would look at it. Pokey Rangers, or Poke Rangers. I'm going to guess it's Pokey Rangers. How do you handle painting very small freehand details like teeth on the Karchadon Power Armor? So what I use for painting teeth and really small details and stuff like that is Games and Gears is a name of a company out of maybe the UK. I think it's maybe the UK. But I've bought the brushes from, I bought their brushes and stuff like at Adepticon. And I've also bought some at um, Nova Open. So Games and Gears makes um, brushes. And one of the brushes they sell is called the Katana. And it is not really a brush. It is shaped just like a brush, but instead of having bristles at the end, it has a pointy thing that is like silicone. So it can't absorb paint. It can't soak up any paint. So it's not, it's not great. Like they, they sell it for like, oh, it's great for freehanding, but it can't hold a paint reservoir. You're basically just putting paint on the tip of a rubbery thing. But for doing teeth, it works great because you can just then, you put a little bit of like, let's say bone white or something on your tip of the, the little rubbery thing on your, and then you just poke, poke, poke and on the teeth and you kind of go through and you have to keep putting more paint on because again, like I said, it can't absorb and soak up any paint, but I find it works very well. You could also use a toothpick or a cocktail stick, uh, depending on where you live. But um, the I find a lot more control by holding an actual full size brush as opposed to a little you know, toothpick. Um, but that's what I like to use for, for painting teeth on like monsters or dragons or, you know, demons or whatever. Um, I can use it for eyes sometimes too, especially if you just want, like if you've already painted the eye and you just want to like, and we're talking about like a space marine, you know, eye lens or whatever, but you just want to put like a light dot in there that looks like a reflection. Um, it works well for that too, but it's pretty, 
it's honestly a little limited. Like that's really what it's good for. It's I've tried to do a little bit of freehand with it, and because it can't hold a reservoir of paint, really, it doesn't it doesn't work that well. But for for teeth and for eyes and stuff like that, I find it that um, Games and Gears Katana works quite nice. And you you buy it like in a set of other brushes, I think. And I like their brushes. I've been using them quite a bit lately. So um, you know, if I'm not using something super cheap, like I there. The one katana brush that are not katana, sorry, one of the games and gears brushes that I've been using a lot is when I want to get like kind of like blending and stuff like that because it's a longer brush, so it's got a little bit more. Uh, you can put a little bit more water in there. Like a shorter brush is harder to blend with. Anyway, um, so when I'm doing regular just like base coating and stuff like that, I'm using kind of crappy brushes. And then if I want to get into something a little bit more fancy, I have a tendency to switch over. So yeah. <clears throat> Brian Schmidt says, I also kind of loathe card games, but I bought the Keyforge starter box. Seems cool for a card game. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, it's it's something that I think would be just sort of fun to mess around with from time to time. Um, it obviously, you know, it's far easier to carry than an entire, you know, army or, or all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's... I, like, I don't really play board games. And I don't really play RPGs much. Once in a great while. So, I, you know... Do want to sometimes be able to branch out a little bit here and there. What else? VJ Morph says, I got a katana. I found the paint dried too quickly on it. It does. It's not a, like, it's definitely something like for just, like I said, for just doing eyes, just doing teeth, and you're constantly going back and adding a little more paint, like, you know, two, three, four, five teeth, maybe tops, and then you go back, maybe even less. Um, because yeah, again, there's no, it can't, the, 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 the tip can't hold any water. It can't hold any paint, you know, but it's, it's easier than using a toothpick, at least in my opinion. Um, Torch says, I didn't like it, the katana, unless it's a dot. Exactly. That's, that's what it's good for. Like if it's a dot, like you're, you know, like a little bit of teeth or whatever, you know, or an eye, but when it was when I was first told about it, they're like, oh, it's great for freehand, and I have not found that to be the case. But it is for me at least indispensable for doing like teeth and, and eyes and, and stuff like that, real small bits. Because when I try to use a brush for that, if the tip of the bristles is all you know, blah, like this, blah, that's a technical term, then uh, I don't get a nice sharp you know point. So that's kind of the issue. Um. What else have we see here? Raphael says, have you seen Rampart's magnetized modular terrain? I think there was some sort of Kickstarter. If I think it, it kind of looks like the Kill Team stuff, except that it's magnetized. I don't really know anything else about it, but I did see, I don't know, like a, I saw a link or something somewhere. It, it, oh, no, I know where I saw it. They were advertising it over on um, yeah, Beasts of War, I think. I think I was at the Beast of War website, and I saw they had a huge banner that they were advertising for it, so... Yep. Um, Leon Rollstone says, I just sat on my ass and painted 60 Salamander Space Marine Metallics. That's a lot. My eyes hurt, he says. That, that, yeah, that 60 in a row, is, that takes a long time. And I don't, like I said, I, I will go 10 before I kind of start to, you know, lose my mind. So 10 will, yeah, I don't want to go much further than that. Um, 3D Carrera Freak says, Uncle Adam, have you checked out the new game from the creator of Frostgrave called Rangers of Shadow Deep? I haven't checked it out, but I have heard of it because I was I was at the RPGnow.com uh, website and uh, I was just looking for something else. And, or no, I take that back. It's affiliated to RPG Now. It's actually called War Games Vault. So I was looking for, so it's, it's a place where people can upload games that they've worked on and you can download them as PDFs and then, you know, pay them and all that kind of stuff. Or you can even get them printed as like print-on-demand books. And so there's an RPG Now, which is all RPG stuff. And then they've got a bunch of them. They've got a card one called drive Through Cards or something like that. And then there's also a, a division of that same company called War Games Vault. So if you go to War Games Vault, um, I was looking at the top sellers and one of them was this Rangers of Shadow Deep, And it said uh, Joseph McCullough. I think that's his name. And I was like, is that the guy who did Frostgrave? And then I read a little bit more, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But I haven't tried it out or you know, anything like that, so I don't really know much about it. But it's cool that he's kind of branching off and doing a little bit of kind of like self-publishing to some degree. I think that's interesting. So, yeah. 
Um, what else? Hi, Adam. Do you think GW will go back to the Imperial... It says Imperial Gord. I'm assuming you mean Imperial Guard, but the Imperial Gord does sound like a lot of fun. Um, do you think they will go back to the Imperial Guard for new sets? Um, yeah, I don't know, because, like, the Codex came out, and, you know, they didn't... They released a little... Did they release anything when the new Codex came out for Imperial Guard? Did the new Imperial Guard Codex come out? I don't even remember now. There's been so many Codexes that have come out, Codices, that have come out in the last 18 months. I don't... They must have. I think they did. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, they should. They, I think they should come out with some new stuff for Imperial Guard. That would be nice. I mean, they got the... The newest stuff really that's come out for them has been like the Tempestus Scions, and that's about it. There had, I've been, I haven't remembered a lot of other stuff that's come out, so... Mark Pendle says, thanks for your videos with Sam Lenz. I just caught up with them, and I'm highly recommending them to anyone who will listen. Well, good. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, there are at least one more. I think two more. I think there are two more we filmed, because there's the one a couple weeks ago that we put up. That's the first in a series of, like, three, I think. And so there's two more that I'm going to be putting up to soon as well. I might, I might put one up this Friday, because then that way... I could edit it today because we got Thanksgiving coming up and there's going to be family and all kinds of, you know, all that jazz. So I'm not sure. It's either going to be coming up this Friday or maybe the next week. But yeah, there'll be another one coming. Um, there will also be a special short one that's maybe only about two, three minutes long that I might put on Facebook to try to get more people to... And then I'll have a link in it that will send to the playlist on YouTube so people can see all of the Sam videos and stuff like that. So we'll see. Um, but we did film technically a fourth one that day, but it was just super, super short. So, um, yeah, there's, there's plans. Um, but if you haven't, you should go check out Sam on Twitch. Sam has been filming two or three days a week now on Twitch. It's like Wednesdays and Thursdays, like at 2 p.m. Central. And then I think he also does another night, maybe Tuesday night, like later. But um, he's been killing it on Twitch. It's uh, twitch.tv slash, I think it's just Samson Arts with an S on the end. Or Samson Art. But I think it's Samson Arts. I think if you just type in Sam Lens Twitch into Google, you'll probably find it. But yeah, he's been doing really well. Um, tons of painting, you know, obviously. And he's very good at, like, talking to chat while he's working and, and being able to do all that stuff. And it's been working out really nicely. So definitely go check out Sam on Twitch and uh, get, your, get your Sam fix weekly if you want to now you know what I mean um what else have we got here Jonas says do you think Games Workshop will mash the armies together again like the Beasts of Chaos brought together the Beastmen again some armies are really scattered could work if they got more models I saw that start collecting box for Beasts of Chaos yesterday and I was like oh man I kind of want to pull the trigger on that because it's it's a nice looking set of stuff and I could be like well because I've got Beastmen in my Age of Sigmar Chaos Army, it's this chaos soup between mainly like, uh, like there's some Varengard, there's some Beastmen, there's some Skaven, there's some other junk. It's just, there's a whole bunch of different stuff going on in there. And so, um, yeah, I'm, uh, but I was looking at that, those, that, that new Beastman box, especially because it's got that big guy in there, and I was like, mm, that's kind of cool. But, um, yeah, I don't know if they're going to be mushing together more people like that. They may, you know, that it, if it if it if it increases sales and, and makes people be able to buy like a single kit for cheap that can then have a whole bunch of different stuff in it, I'm you know I'm sure that they'll probably look at doing it. It makes sense. JP Got Rocket says that the Imperial Gourd might be a bit seedy. Yeah, I can see that. That makes sense. The Big Goblin eighty six. I'm struggling to get motivated into painting an army I've been putting off for a while. I really want to paint it, but I can't stick at it. Uh, I've got a bunch of videos about motivation. I should probably make. That's a good point. I should probably make a, uh, what do you call it, a, a, a playlist on on uh, my channel of motivational stuff and, and that kind of thing. I would tell you, if you're trying to stay motivated with something like that, uh, link it to something else. Um, if you can watch television slash Netflix or whatever while you paint, I can't because then I just stop painting and I just, just watch TV. Um, if you can do that and still be productive then find like some long series and then just watch it while you're painting. You know what I mean? And just go through it that way. Or audiobooks, that's way better in my opinion because you can easily do them both at the same time. One's visual, one's audio, and it works out well. Uh, podcasts, 
you know, there's a lot of big podcasts out there that have got a lot of backlogs. You can go way back and start from the beginning and go through. Um, but linking that stuff to your painting, like I've said a bunch of times before, like if you're going to sit down and listen to a book, well, you you probably should be doing something while you're doing that. You don't just want to sit there in the living room and listen to the book. So painting while you're doing it, you may not want to go downstairs and paint, but you may want to go downstairs and hear what's going on, you know, in the next chapter. So, um, and then you would paint while you're doing that. What else have we got here? Um, Kenny Wildman says, Hey, Adam, thanks for taking the time to make all this great content. Well, sure. I thought that this was your day job, but the fact that you do work as well makes this all more admirable. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, this isn't my day job. This is, um, this is my, this is my side hustle, as the kids like to say these days. Um, it is, uh, the, my day job is, my day job is working for a company. We make apps, um, and mobile apps and uh, websites and things like that. And one of the apps we make is Game4. But we also do other stuff for other companies and, and things like that. Um, Game4 is for us. That's our product that we made for us. Usually we get paid to make stuff for other companies, but this is a thing we wanted to do. So parts of my job are related to this. Uh, but yeah, right. But this is not my day job. This is something I do on the side. So that's why... I make basically like a video every Friday and I make, um, you know, I've got these live shows every other Sunday and I've got the Patreon show that happens once per month for um, Uncle Adam's Irregulars, which is at the, the, the $4 level Patreons. And um, I do want to start moving into hopefully trying to do a Monday video on the opposite Monday from the every other Sunday show. So you see what I'm saying? So like there's if there's a if there's an every other Sunday show on Sunday then the next day there would not be a video. But if there's not an every other Sunday show, then the next day there would be a Monday, which would be a pre, not a, not a live thing, but a pre-recorded thing. And I'm thinking about trying to do those in the series, you know, be working on different things. Um, but trying to find the time is difficult uh, because I'm also trying to paint models so that I can do bat reps. I've got just about five uh, armies for Kill Team done. I'm just about to finish my Imperial Guard. And then I have to do a little bit of terrain. I have to paint the ground uh, that I've got. I bought a, a, a tile set from Secret Weapon Miniatures. So that I'll be using that instead of just like a, ba a battle mat. And then I was actually just talking with a friend of mine earlier today. And we will probably try to film one of the first bat reps, hopefully right around Christmas. Um, but there might be one actually that I can film even quicker. It depends on how quickly I can get the terrain done. Um, so yeah, there's only so much time in the day. And, um, and that's kind of the issue. If this was my day job, then yeah, I could put out a lot more content because I would be spending eight to 10 hours a day just working on, on this. So, um, but you know, it's, it is what it is. I've been doing it for almost six years. It'll be six years in March and, um, it's been going well and I'm glad that I can help, you know, get new people into the hobby and hopefully keep people motivated and all that kind of stuff too. Um, let me see here. What else? Side hustle. Yeah, that's that's what the kids these days. Matthew Sears, however, this uh, being moderator Matt uh, once every other week, that's his day job. It's not true. It's not his, it's not his day job at all. Um, Matthew Sears also has a day job, but he also has a side hustle, and it's not this. It's making uh, Wreckage, which is a spectacular um, game. It's a skirmish game post-apocalyptic we've talked about it here before on the show uh, you should go check it out um vj morphs is uh, adam update on hot mess uh uncle adam's hot mess is one of those monday series things um it it's gonna take it's basically when i can find time to be able to kind of because the thing is too is that you don't with youtube you don't want to lose your consistency so I just recently, back in October, passed three years of hitting every single Friday, making a video every single Friday for over three years now. Um, and that really helps YouTube notice you and go, oh, this person seems to have their stuff together, they're serious, and then you get better video rankings. Um, I try to not miss any of these every other Sunday shows, same deal. If I switch to start doing these every other Monday bits that are more of a series, I don't want to like do one and then stop and then do a couple and then screw it up or whatever. So I've got to make it like, it has to become, it's kind of like fitness. <laughs> like if you want to get fit, you actually have to make it a habit. Now, 
uh, this is what I've read, obviously. Um, but if you want to get fit, you have to make it a habit and part of your life so that you like all of a sudden it doesn't occur to you to not do it. You know what I mean? Um, that's just a big you know, productivity in general is kind of like that. But anyway, it's it's a thing. So we will see. Um, it's but it's 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 a coming. Intense pickle. That's a, that's a good name. I'm experimenting with. A uh, for fun list using three supreme command detachments comprising of ultramarines, space wolves, and custodes. Your opinion of on on an all character list? Would you play it? Probably not. I mean, not in 40k. Um, I do want to give a try in kill team because there's commanders now. We were t I was talking about with this at a, with a friend of mine at the shop yesterday. Um, like there is a commander like you can take a brood lord like a fourth level brood lord that is 196 points. So that's your only model in a 200 point game. And then I would like to take him up against say Imperial Guard where a level four commander is only like 65 points. And then you get a bunch like 135 points of extra troops and then just have one model versus 18, whatever, and have them fight and see how that works out. I would like to do that for science and, uh, and see how that works out. I don't know about, like I've never been a big for 40K, a big like just take a bunch of beat sticks and as a detachment and kind of go like that, I like to kind of stick with like I've got a certain amount of troops and stuff like that. I believe in way to fire in a lot of situations, but um, I would love to see if I was wrong. You know what I mean? I'd love to see if a brood lord, like a fourth level brood lord, could just chew through all those guys and just take a whole bunch of you know shots and not die. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to check out. So we're gonna see. Useful G says hot mess Mondays. It's coming. Well, it wouldn't just be hot mess Mondays. I'm saying that. Mondays would be series shows, so like one of them could be a hot mess, and I might a hot the hot mess show is for those of you that haven't heard it in the past would be me going onto eBay buying a model that looks like a hot mess, stripping it all down and repainting it. It may just be a single episode for that model, and then another. So there's that kind of thing. So I would kind of put those on potentially on Mondays. But then another show I've been thinking about doing is like hobby progress vlogs, where maybe I spend two or three episodes just talking about like here's a start for this entire unit or this piece of terrain, and then these videos go through, and then now you see it at the end. Um, and I've got a couple other ideas for other shows, but they would be different than the normal Friday show, which is just usually a topic, and I talk about something. They would be maybe they would, maybe I would do reviews. I don't know. I'm not 100 percent sure yet, but um, it would be a like a show with a name. It wouldn't just be the Tabletop Minions you know, intro. It would be like something else. So anyway, that's where we're trying to figure that out. Um, Tom Crea says, anyone have a, some good recommendations for an airbrush booth? I could build one, but I have enough projects going on at the moment. Uh, type in, go to Amazon if you can, and go to, just type in airbrush booth um, lighted, I think, or something like that, or LED airbrush booth. There's an airbrush booth that you can get on Amazon for about a hundred bucks that even has LEDs in it to light up nicely. It's got the fan, it's got the hose, it's got the filter, the whole deal. It's really pretty nice. Um, I don't own one because I have my own little airbrush room underneath the stairs. Me and Harry Potter hang out in there, um, down in the basement. But uh, I have seen them in person at, where the hell? Oh, is it, is it Nova? The Nova Open this year. They had up in the hobby area, they had two or three of them hooked up so that you could, if you needed to airbrush something real quick, they had like stations like in the hobby area where you could go and, and work on your stuff. And um, and yeah, they're real nice. They're not too big, but they do a good a good job. And like I said, if you buy the ones that have the LEDs in them, they light up nice and so you can see what you're doing. So yeah, um, Amazon is the place to look for that kind of thing, in my opinion. Matthew says, moderator Matt Mondays. Well, that's not a half bad idea. His first guest is Adam Loper. Oh, well, that's not a bad idea either. Um, Ian Grantham says, that idea of an IG kill team up against one tanky Tyranid gets my fluff sensors tingling. Yeah, mine too. I, I am, like, as soon as I saw that in the Commander book, and I'm like, you can make a Commander that's 196 points out of 200? What the heck else are you going to bring? Like, nothing. So I'm like, that's kind of cool. I might like to try that out just to see what it's like. Um, I do have a brood lord. I just have to build him and paint him. But that wouldn't be, I mean, it's one person. It wouldn't take that long. I mean, he's not a person. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that Tyranids aren't people. Don't get me wrong. I'm not sure where that went. Um, Mr. Mendeleev says, cooking with Uncle Adam Monday. I'd watch that. I don't know that I would. I don't, I can't cook, I don't think. I mean, I can, I used to make a, a mean um, 
uh, macaroni and cheese with cut up hot dogs in it. That's about as far as that goes, yeah. Otherwise, it's a lot of microwaves and stuff, so I don't know. Roland Robinson says, how many hours do you spend on a single model? It depends on how long you want to, what you're trying to achieve, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're just trying to do desktop or desktop, uh, tabletop quality, like stuff that you just want to use for, to game with, I would try to go as quickly as possible and try to try to find as many efficiencies, and I'm not saying cut corners, but efficiencies, wink, wink, um, that you can find and still have a quality that you like. That's a big portion of getting better as a painter is starting to figure out where you can like speed things up and be like, you know, if I add three more layers of wash to this, no one will notice. So let's not do that. Kind of that kind of stuff. Because I've done that in the past where I will spend all kinds of time working on the shading on a, you know, and doing all this stuff on a, on a shoulder pad. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Now I only have 50 more of those guys to do or whatever. So I just kind of don't do that for regular troops. But if you are sitting down to paint a big fancy display piece because you want to make a really cool diorama or something, you're going to spend dozens of hours probably on it very easily. Um, the big diorama that Sam won uh, Best to Show with at the Nova Open, um, I think he said he spent over 100 hours on it. I mean, that's, you know, that's like a, that's a more, that's a two and a half hour, or that's a two and a half work week you know, like, stretch of time. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, definitely. I would I would definitely take a look at thinking about, like, well, what, what's your, what's, what are you trying to f accomplish? If you're trying to do a display piece, you're going to spend a lot of time on it, probably. If you're trying to make pieces that you're going to use for gaming, you want to spend as little time on it as possible up until the point at which you make it look like garbage to you. You know what I mean? And everybody's different as far as what they like, as far as what they think is a good a good look versus a bad look. Ryan Andrew Edwards says, Uncle Adam, how do you decide on color schemes for your kill team that are unique but also cohesive? I'm struggling for my death guard to make them not look like normal schemes. I'm getting a lot of good questions today, I got to admit. Um, so you want to make them kind of match, but each of them look a little different. Okay, that's interesting. With death guard, like when I painted up my death guard, I used basically the same normal armor color because they're wearing power armor. It's just that there's a lot of boils on it and tentacles and crap sticking out of them. So for the, the tentacles and crap, I had a tendency to make those all kinds of different colors. I made their boils variations on a theme, but mostly the same colors. But the armor itself, I kept the armor all the same color on all those guys. Now, what you could do in that situation, specifically with Death Guard, the idea behind, the lore behind Death Guard is they were normal, you know, pre-heresy space marines, and then... Everything went all sideways, and then they became evil and bad and, and, and gross and all that kind of stuff. So the reason I kept the armor all the same color is because I'm like, they would have looked this way before they went all, you know, squirrely and tentacly. So their armor should look the same. Now, what you could do, though, start with the base color on the armor, make their, all their armor the same theme, the same scheme. But then you could use a lot of different colors of washes. So like this guy, his armor was, let's say, olive drab color or whatever, which is kind of what I did for mine. But then like the sores and the weird crap that came off of him kind of leaks more of a sepia color, whereas this one's more of a black color and this one's more of a green color or whatever. So you could throw washes over the same base armor color over and over again, throw the washes on there that are all different, and that would give them the kind of the difference. The thing is with the Death Guard specifically is that they are those models are all so different from each other. Like, one's got a fly head, and one's got, like, you know, weird tentacle coming out of the back of his neck or whatever. You can do a lot to them to make them look very different. I mean, even just unpainted, they look a good deal different from each other. But they're all based off of, obviously, the same kind of original design because they used to not look like this kind of crazy, you know, corpse explosion. They used to look basically like a bunch of dudes in the same armor. So... I would look at it from that aspect. If you want to make them kind of color variated but still look cohesive, start with the same base color and then use washes that are different on each guy to give them that. Like, they all started green, but now this guy's been leaking red. That's not good. You know, this guy's been leaking blue. That's weird. You know, that kind of stuff. So you could kind of do some of that. And, and how crazy you want to go with that totally depends on how crazy you want to go with that. So that's kind of the way that works. Um... What else have we got? 
a bunch of people talking about airbrush booths. Yeah, like if I had a window in my tiny little Harry Potter room, I would maybe think about an airbrush booth, but I don't. So um, I would have to I would have to knock a hole through the foundation of the house, which I'm not prepared to do. Um, or I could just get a garbage can and then have the fan blow into the garbage can and fill the garbage can full of paper towel, like crumpled up paper towel, and then the particulate would go through there and hit the paper towel, and then eventually once in a while I could just... Eh, I'm not sure if that would work. Maybe. Um, let's see here. Pancho Arrera says, cool camera. Well, uh, well thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm using a, a... It's actually, it's a... For people that are interested, it is a Panasonic Lumix G7 with a 25 millimeter 1.7 lens. And, um, and then it's plugged via an HDMI cable into something from Elgato, which is the guys who make a lot of streaming stuff. And it is a, called, it's called a cam link. And it just looks like a big thumb drive. And you plug HDMI into one side of it, and then it's got USB 3 plug on the outside, and you plug it into the USB 3 port on your computer. And then your computer thinks that your camera is a webcam. And it works out pretty well, so. Um, yeah. Let me see. Kenny Wildman says, or Wildman, but it might be Wildman, says, regarding making Death Guard look different, there's enough nerglings available that you could decorate near any model for, for an extra fleck of personality individually. That's also very true. Um, customizing stuff like that would also work very well. Like I've said, the, the new Death Guard models are very different from each other which is cool, but if you wanted to go even further, you could use a bunch of Nurglings. I'm not a big Nurgling fan. I don't like the kind of comic relief, little dancing, kind of farting, weird Nurgling guys. I don't know why, but, um, you know, it's up to you. The Tabletop Experience asks, how do you balance work, family, and hobby time? I have been finding it difficult to find hobby time between spending time with my wife, spending time with my kids, and working. Um, well, I don't hobby during work, so that's easy for me. Uh, I don't have any kids, so there's that too. Um, that doesn't work for everybody, obviously. Um, and my wife and I, I mean, you know, we eat dinner together and stuff, and we have different hobbies, like she likes to knit, and um, she's a musician, uh, hence uh, uh, Nick back here. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it takes a bit of planning, it, it takes sometimes a bit of like, like there's times when I'm like, I, I know like that she's going to be gone, so we're probably not going to like watch a movie or do anything along those lines. So then I can definitely kind of hunker down and do a bunch of hobby stuff. But yeah, with kids, kids don't care about what you want to get done in the hobby or, um, or, or anything along those lines generally, especially when they're real small. They're not built to care. They're built to, to try to survive and they have to get your attention to do that generally. So, um, so yeah, that is difficult. So I don't have any great tips for how to hobby around kids. As kids get older, I have seen plenty of people, obviously, like on the Paint Showcase Club on Facebook and places like that, people talk about like, oh, I've started teaching my kids. So you give them some like cheap models that you bought at wherever, you know, eBay or Hobby Lobby or something like that, some army men from the grocery store, and you teach them how to paint, and you give them some crappy brushes, and they do some painting, and then while they're doing their painting, you can be over here trying to do your painting, and now you're spending quality time and potentially building yourself a very young and eventually hopefully older um, tabletop wargamer, so that's pretty cool. But um, when they're real, real little, if they're real, real little, you can sometimes put them on one of those uh, uh, one of those like backpacks that you put on the front and you put a baby in it, and then you can sit there and paint, but um, sometimes the head gets in the way probably, or you sometimes, hopefully you don't like pour wash on your baby, because that's going to be hard to explain. But, you know, it, it depends. This is all me just pulling this stuff out of my ass, because like I said, I don't have any kids. I've got cats. I mean, I think I have cats. I saw them earlier, but they're all gone right now. So, uh, yeah. Matt Schaub says, instead of paper towels, fill the trash can with kitty litter. That'd be a lot of kitty litter. Jeez Louise. Um, well, I was thinking the paper towel, because somebody had told me about that once before, where you were basically venting the particulate into, uh, like, a, a trash can, and then it would come in and hit the paper towel and then stick to the paper towel and then you could just dump out the you know the paper towel put some different paper towel in in a month or two or depending on how much you airbrush um because the kitty litter it would just i don't know maybe i mean it's not the smell you're trying to get rid of or anything like that the whole point of the airbrush uh what do you call it the the hood you know the whole point of that is so that you don't get particulate paint 
all over your wherever you're you're doing this stuff. You want to suck the particulate paint through or into the filter or or something like that. The other thing too, the good point here is that there's a filter, almost like a furnace filter in built into this airbrush booth. So a lot of the particulate is going to stick to that and then you just buy another filter once in a while. So that's not too bad. Um it's not the fumes or the vapor because you're generally using an air compressor, so it's just compressed air. So it's not like a like if you were using a, a spray can, rattle can, that's a whole different story. Then you want the exhaust because you're hoping to be able to suck up enough of the terrible propellant smell and blow it outside. Blowing that propellant smell into a garbage can would not do you any good. So it depends on what you're doing. If you're actually just using an airbrush, the whole reason of the, the hood is just to sort of suck up particulate. I don't necessarily have a hood for mine in the basement because I'm in this weird little room under the basement and if it gets covered in paint dust, I don't care because eventually, like once every three years, I'll just wipe everything down and it'll be fine. But if I was trying to airbrush in the rest of the basement and I didn't want the rest of the basement to have be covered in paint dust or if I was doing it in the living room or something like that, that's a different story. Like when I was at Nova, they were doing it in a lounge, you know, on the third floor or whatever. Well, obviously the air, the, the, um, hotel would get ticked off if there was just a bunch of a fine dust of paint you know particles everywhere after the convention was done so that you use the the um hoods to suck up the paint particles and to get it stuck in the filter and, and that kind of stuff but you're using compressors so there's no odor um let me see here Nick Romando ate the cats. OMG. No, no, I don't I don't think he did. They're just probably upstairs by my wife or sleeping in the bedroom. That happens a lot too. Leon Ralston says, can't you just tie a vacuum cleaner bag around the exhaust of the airbrush booth? No, that's not a bad idea. Like I don't we don't have vacuum cleaner bags anymore because our vacuum cleaner is one of those where you it's like a plastic thing and you dump it out. But yeah, if you could find one, that might work. Full Metal says, is there a color scheme you tend to gravitate towards? Hmm. Not particularly. Um, no, I mean, not really. I have a tendency to... Not in every situation. In some situations, I do have a tendency to stick a little bit to like... Like, let's say my Imperial Guard, they look kind of like like what's on the box as far as the color scheme is concerned. I didn't go crazy with them on, on that. I wanted my normal Imperial Guard for Kill Team to look like normal Imperial Guard. My scions, I did not follow what the scions look like on the box. What I did instead is I kind of actually matched them a little bit more to the look of the regular Imperial Guard. So they're more of like an olive drab, um, like their big chest plate thing is like more olive drab, whereas on the, um, the box, the scions have like a dark blue chest plate with like gold trim or maybe silver, I don't remember. Um, so I kind of used, I only, I kind of tweaked it there, but I mean, it totally depends. Um, but yeah, there's not any single one. I do have a tendency to use the same colors over and over for certain materials. I use the same colors for metals that I normally do. I use the same colors for, um, a lot of times for like leather pouches and stuff like that. I have a tendency to use like, oh, I use this particular chocolate brown from Vallejo, and then I use this to highlight it, and I use this wash. But for other stuff, I kind of make things up on the fly to some degree. Uh, the Tabletop Experience says, I have to ask, is it weird that my seven-year-old daughter has been asking me for a Flesh Eater Quartz army? Uh, nah, it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. I would keep an eye on her at night, but otherwise it's fine. Um, Dean Sturgis says, hey, what do, you think of, what do you think to Warlord selling versions of Blood Red Skies with foam inserts for the miniatures included? I think it's a cool idea. Um, I think that, you know, like uh, uh, Battle Foam, I was going to say Beasts of War because they both start with B. Uh, Battle Foam produces a bunch of different foam inserts designed for board games. So, like, let's say you play Space Hulk. You can go to them and buy a Space Hulk insert that will hold all the little people but still hold them in the Space Hulk box. They do a lot of that for a bunch of different games. Because they're like, okay, you're a board game player. I'm probably not going to be able to sell you the cool big bag, but I can sell you the foam insert that's perfectly designed to fit inside the box that you already have and then keep everything safe. And so you're still buying something, so we'll do that. Um, the fact that 
a company like Warlord is either having those made and put into their boxes as a special add-on or is working maybe even just with, maybe they're working with Battle Foam. I don't know. Um, it's a cool idea. I think that because you're seeing more and more board games that have miniatures in them, um, if people are painting those miniatures, they want to keep them safe. And so, but they still kind of want to keep them in the box. That's the big thing about board games in comparison to our miniature stuff. If you're a board game player, you show up someplace, you have the board game, you open it up, everything's in there, you guys play with all your people, and then you put it all away, and then you're done. Whereas with miniatures games, I show up with my container of miniatures, you show up with yours, and then we either need to already have terrain or find terrain and a place to play and a whole deal and a mat or all that jazz, which is why it's a little bit more difficult and probably a big, uh, a not small portion of why um, miniature games are not as popular, let's say, as board games because there's a bit more work involved. But, like I said, we're starting to see more and more board games that have miniatures. Um, Rising Sun, Blood Rage, uh, Shadows of Brimstone, or whatever it's called, that kind of stuff. And there are people that are either board gamers who want to learn to paint, and they're teaching themselves how to paint, or they're having a friend who already paints miniatures paint it for them, or they're even just paying a commission painter, because they want to have a much nicer looking kind of like game like that. So making the inserts um, makes a lot of sense. And if the company itself can just be like, we'll you know, make it an add-on, then they get more profit that way, I assume. I don't know. It works out. It makes sense. Diaz says, let us see the cats. Um, I did just see one walk by. Uh, I can see a tail over there, but I, she's, 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 not, uh, she's not over here. So that doesn't work out. Um, let me see. What else have we got? Uh, Michael Strange says wife cameo. Yeah, she did just walk by a little bit ago. Um, anyone know any good gaming related Black Friday Cyber Monday deals coming up? Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't. I guess. Well, like I said a little bit yesterday in the Patreon show, I'm not a big Black Friday guy, um, and I don't. I don't know if I've seen any mention. I mean, I've seen like you know emails from like Best Buy and places like that. They wanted to start Black Friday back in July. Um, but I haven't seen any big news from game companies on that stuff yet, so I don't know. I, maybe. Um, what else have we got? Just pa Thomas says just painted just passed eight thousand points of total painted minis this year. Nice, good work. Um, yeah, that's that. It it's 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 really nice when it's done. You know what I mean? Like I still enjoy painting, and I'm going to constantly be looking for more stuff to paint. And Lord knows I shouldn't have to look too far. It's mostly the basement. But, um, yeah, it is it it is nice when you've got, like, an army done and you can go play with it and then start focusing on something else and, and that kind of jazz. Torch says, I have a battle foam bag, but everything has a ton of pokey bits that don't sit well in foam. I use magnetic boxes now. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's part of why I think battle foam got into that, too, because they make their magna rack. I think it's called a magna rack. And it's the same type of deal. You put magnets in the bases, and then you just sort of attach these guys, and then they're, they're not touching anything. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but a lot of people do that. Um, my friend who has a Sylvaneth army for Age of Sigmar, I mean, they're all big, pointy, pokey trees, and so he just has magnetized them all and now puts them inside of a like a metal tackle box or toolbox or something like that, and they work just fine that way. Or uh, he puts them in something. They're magnetized, so they're not touching anything except for the base. And um, it works out pretty well. So it depends on the models. I, um, I've i never done that. I've never done the magnetizing thing, but most of my stuff, even my chaos stuff, I don't have too much trouble with it. But I think it's because I have a tendency to put the models into slightly larger spaces. So I can't put as many models into a single tray, but I'm okay with it. It works out pretty well. Uh, JP Got Rockets says that Gaddis Games has a Black Friday 20% off sale. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Mr. Mendeleev says, did you already consider launching a paint brand? As you already have a big audience, it would work very well, and it would be a cool way for us to support you even more. Wow. Uh, no, I have not. That, uh, I got t-shirts. <laughs> um, but as far as a paint brand, I don't know. That's a, ew. like, I would, I don't even know, like, I, manufacturers. I would, obviously, I couldn't make it here, you know, but, um, I suppose there's a possibility that if there was a manufacturer and I liked their stuff and, I mean, that kind of thing happens. There was a, a person I used to watch on YouTube, not a war gamer, but a video gamer, and she was into, um, 
she was into video games, obviously, uh, but she was also into coffee, and so she ended up working with some coffee company and made like her own like they were doing all the work and shipping it out, but it had her name on it, and she was advertising it and getting some sort of uh, I don't know license fee or something like that or whatever. I mean, um, yeah, but I haven't really not a paint brand. No, I don't know who. I mean, I met um, the current president of uh, Vallejo at a, at Origins this year, uh, Alex uh, Vallejo. And he was very nice, and um, I did a little bit of. I painted a, a beholder. They had a booth at Adept or at a, uh, Origins, and they were painting those Whiz Kids beholders. And you paid to get in, and then you could paint the beholder along with um, Jason from Realmsmith TV, who's working directly with um, Vallejo. And then they would have guest painters, and so there was a bunch of different people they had all during the day. And then I got to be a, a guest painter on like a Friday morning or whatever, like you know, for two hours. And so we were sitting there painting beholders, and we had microphones, and we were talking. And it was, I don't know if it was ever put on, it was all recorded, but I don't know if it was ever actually put on YouTube or anything like that. But it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and so I met the Vallejo people, so I kind of got a, 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 a but I don't know that they want to do any kind of um, licensed stuff. But it's, um, it's an interesting concept, and I, I appreciate it. Emily asks, will the new shirts be up before Thanksgiving? Uh, as it turns out, no. Uh, I have been working on them. Um, they're taking a little longer than I thought, and again, I've only got so much time, sadly. But they will be up before Christmas. So, um, the other thing that's kind of a limiting factor, like, I, at least one or two I might have done before Thanksgiving, but I don't want to put them out for sale until I get a copy, until I, they, I, because whenever I make a shirt, I always get it printed first, so that I can actually physically see it and see if it's screwed up, because sometimes, like, because they're digitally printed, it might look great on the screen and everything's fine, but then when people start getting it, they're like, this is all messed up, and I don't want that. So I always make sure that I'm the first person to receive one. So that would be the slowing down factor to not get them done by then. Um, uh, during the Patreon, at the very end of the Patreon show yesterday, I did show off one of the works in progress, um, and so that was cool, but it's not, um, it's, not, it's not done yet, and it actually there's some more work that needs to be, um, yeah. Oh yeah, you guys are mentioning Dodger. Yeah, I used to watch her on YouTube, but she doesn't really do YouTube much anymore. She's on Twitch, I guess. Um, she and her husband, whose name I forget, they had a baby, and that's cool. Um, but yeah, she used to do like a video game news thing like once a week, and I used to watch that, and then I she talked about the coffee thing one time, and I thought that was a cool concept. Technically, I could launch a Uncle Adam Coffee, I bet, because... Uh, Directly below the studio is a coffee shop, and they have their own coffee roaster in the house, and they do it there. So, I don't know. I could do some sort of Uncle Adam coffee if you wanted, but that's that's. But he doesn't do paint down there. So, um, yeah. A line of coffee flavored paints. Well, there. See, there you go. That's not. A, I guess we could do that. Um, hey, Adam. I've been trying to start an army since February. Every time I do that, after painting some models, I get discouraged and find another army I'd like to start. What do? Um, in that situation, I would honestly tell you to look at a skirmish game. I would tell you to look at um, Kill Team. You know, if you're if if the army that you if if you've been painting some stuff and it's 40k, you could probably turn that into some Kill Teams, and then that way you're painting small amounts of people, and then you can get bored with that, and then paint another small amount of people, and then have two armies, and then a third one or whatever. If it's not that, and you just want to paint kind of different, real crazy different stuff, I would look at other types of skirmish games. I would look at um, I'm always going to tell you Wreck Age, because being post-apocalyptic, like, generally they don't match. You know what I mean? Like, when you're in a, in a, in a, you know, a military unit, um, everybody kind of looks the same, generally. That's the idea, for the most part. But when you are a ragtag group of people who are just trying to survive in the wastelands of what's left of Earth, you don't try to make sure your outfits are matchy-matchy. You know what I mean? So uh, you can kind of go through and be like, I'm working on this guy, and he's got these kind of color gloves, and this guy doesn't even have hands, or whatever. And you can go that direction, and and it gives you a little bit more interest area that way. Same with games like Malifaux. Same with games like Song of Blazing Heroes. Same with um, a lot of different games. Um fantasy stuff, all kinds of jazz. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely look into something like that because then you can do a lot of different things. And, and, and that's the one downside to painting and playing in big army games is that you just end up having to paint the same guy over and over and over and over again. So that's one of the deals. Um, definitely. Uh, what?
what else? What else have we got here? Do, do, do. Hello from Finland. Hello, Battle Brother from Finland. Um, paint flavored coffee. That sounds like a terrible idea. I don't want to do that either. Um, what else? Shadespire is great for people with hobby ADD. That's a very good point as well. Because in Shadespire, I think the biggest group of models in Shadespire so far is, is it seven or nine? I, the, the skeletons in the first wave in Shadespire, the skeletons, the sepulchral guard was seven models. But in the new Night Haunt edition, there might be a group of nine. And they might be grots or goblins or I don't know. But yeah, it's you can also end up painting a, model, a group of models that's only three. Like the, the, the um, Stormcast guys are like three models. So you paint those three guys and you're done. And then you can move on to a different one. So yeah, that's a good point too. Um, Agrax, Earthshade, and Coffee are virtually indistinguishable until it's too late. That is true. And I showed this yesterday to the folks at, in Patreon, and I forgot about it. I picked this up, too, when I picked up my Keyforge game or whatever. And this is the new... Uh, here we go. This is the new... Um, uh, whatever you... Pink cup, water cup thing from Citadel, which you may look at it and go, well, that's stupid. I mean, I've got a cup. I don't need to pay eight bucks for a special cup. But it's got some benefits to it. So it's got these notches in the front here and here um, and then you can just set your brush there as long as it's flat and so it kind of sits there which is sort of a nice little feature like most cups don't have that kind of thing also the inside is ridged um, so as you're using the, the you're rubbing the paint remember the bristles back and forth in the inside of the cup it's helping to knock more of the paint off you can see in the bottom it's also ridged so you can kind of do it and get more paint off and then lastly it's got these notches here so as you are drawing your paint brush up you catch the it's very hard to show this you catch the bristles in one of those notches and it basically points the bristles as you pull the, the paint up because it's the notch if you look at it real closely it kind of tapers so if you put the, the tip in there and you kind of pull it up you're going to actually point your 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 brush in theory um and it's like eight bucks also um i'm not going to pick this up by accident and try to drink it because it's a weird shape like it's flanged out on the bottom and all that kind of stuff so um yeah, I think that's important. Generally, right now, my paint cup I use is like a disposable plastic cup that's like real kind of like this. And um, I've never picked it up and gone, oh, I should drink this because it's also, because it, like, I'm normally drinking out of a soda can. So I, as soon as I would touch it, I'd be like, that's not a soda can. But a lot of people like to paint, drink out of mugs and also paint out of mugs, and that can get problematic. So um, yeah, but that little cup, it's, it's nice. I'm going to give it a try out and see what, what I think about it. George says, can't remember if I've asked this before, but have you are but uh, have you looked into monster monster apocalypse? Forces range from six to thirty-three models, depending on how big you go. I tried to get into Monster Apocalypse back in the day when it was pre-paints and there was like kind of random pack stuff. I it was after it launched a good deal. Um, and then I started picking up stuff on eBay. Because I thought it was gonna be kind of cool, and I thought the models were sort of neat. And then I just really did not, did not like the game, like the actual rules and the way that the game was played. I just didn't like it. I liked all the cool little pre-painted, you know, kind of kaiju and all that jazz. And I liked little buildings and all that stuff. But I didn't like the, like, random pack, like, you know, forced scarcity stuff, which obviously the new Monster Apocalypse is not doing. And the new Monster Apocalypse is unpainted, so it's designed for painters to some degree. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if the game has changed much. I just did not like the game. I don't know why. It was just a just a weird thing to me. I mean, it was it was I was being weird. I'm not saying it was a bad game. People seemed to enjoy it for as long as it was on. Um, t DJ Todd P. Harris says I use a pickle jar. Well, there you go. Um, Alexander's using a light plastic Pokemon mug. Everybody uses different stuff. I mean, like, if I remember correctly, I don't know if he still does, but Sam for the longest time was using, like, a big glass goblet, which might have been, like, a special, like, Lord of the Rings goblet that you could get at Burger King, like, as a, you know what I mean? Like, they were, like, collector's goblets that you get at Burger King when, back when Lord of the Rings came out. And it was, you know, it, that's the other thing, too, though, I have to be honest, is that one of the reasons I usually use uh, disposable cups is because I have a tendency to leave the water in there overnight you know, maybe, and, and then it starts to evaporate and then it gets grungy around the edges and I don't want that to happen with this because if it's all filled with grunge and paint like I'm going to have to probably be a little bit more proactive about when I get done for the painting or done painting for the night take this upstairs rinse it out in the sink 
And then when I want to go back downstairs, fill it up and take it back downstairs. If I just leave it down there and just let it slowly kind of like get ick, um, then I have to go buy another one of these once it's completely choked with ick and I don't want to do that. So hopefully this will help me at least be it. And it's probably better. Like I'm not great at, at changing out my water and I should be better at it. So this will hopefully help as well. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, Nafaniel. Nafaniel? Pronouncing that totally wrong. Sure of it. Um, what do you think about using masking liquid? Um, I have used it very sparingly. There have been a couple of times, like I ended up having a bottle for some reason. I don't even know why. I'm pretty sure it was Vallejo masking liquid. And for those of you who don't know, masking liquid is basically a liquid that you can put on, you can kind of paint it onto a part of a model, and when it dries, it's almost like a it's almost like a rubbery kind of consistency, and then you can airbrush over the top of it or paint or what around it and stuff like that. And then when you're when you when you've got all that done, you can then using like a very sharp like exacto hobby blade or whatever, you can try to basically peel it up. It's almost like flex seal, you know what I mean? You can then peel it up and it shouldn't stick to the paint underneath it, hopefully, but it will you know, mask off the area. It there's also chipping medium. There's a lot of different things like that that Vallejo makes, and at least in this consideration. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've it's a li- it's 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 fiddly. I find it fiddly. Um, the only reason I used it it was because I could not figure out a better way to do it with like let's say silly putty or poster putty or something like that. A lot of times though, poster putty or silly putty can do the trick. Um, in this very situation, it was like I'd already painted kind of like an eye on this creature, and I then had to do some work around it, and I did not want to get it on the eye that I'd finished because I was pretty happy with that, so I just tried to do that. And it thankfully did not screw anything up, but I think it's also, I think it's one of those deals where like if you put the chipping, or I'm sorry, the masking uh, fluid on there, and then you let it dry, and you paint around it, and you get it off like in the same day, you're fine, but if you let it sit for like a month before you try to peel it off, then you're less likely to to not pull, you know, extra paint off. So, yeah. We will see. Um, Hansa says, using yogurt cups for painting water. Cheap. Eat the yogurt first. Well, yeah, that's probably helpful. Disposable, and there's no chance that you may mistake it for your drink. That's also a very good point. Um, Yeah. Brian Griffith says, I wonder if the new water pots are dishwasher safe. Uh, I wonder if it says. Because there's a label. Uh, manufactured in China, designed in the UK, uh, does not say anywhere whether it is dishwasher safe. It is uh, PP number five recyclable. It's got that little recyclable symbol there. You probably can't see that, but um, yeah. So I don't know if it's dishwasher safe or not. Maybe top shelf. I don't know. <clears throat> DPS asks, how can I try and inspire my husband to start painting his armies again? It's been a few years since he painted, and I used to help him. I've suggested it a few times and help him, but he was meh. I mean, if a person's meh, and and that's just where they're at, it's very difficult to be... to, to It's difficult to... You can lead a horse to water, that kind of thing. That's difficult. Um... Sometimes a new game, you know, maybe if the two of you are, are both playing and you're like, hey, let's get together and play this new game, and it's a skirmish game, and you can both do a small army and, and do that, um, you know, that works. Uh, if Again, if you can do it while, if you can paint while watching, like, Netflix or television, maybe you find some series that the two of you always wanted to sit and watch. Um, you know, it's got multiple seasons, and then you can kind of go through the series and stuff like that and have that in the background while you're painting and doing stuff. But, you know... Potentially, sometimes new game can help. Um, if if a person is sitting on twenty five hundred points of um, you know uh, Nurgle demons for Age of Sigmar, and they're just not feeling it anymore, maybe then is the time to to sell. You know, uh, to to put that stuff on eBay and get rid of it, and then get something that they're more interested in. Whether it's a new game, whether it's a smaller army, whether it's a different army, you know, anything like that. Um, Motivation takes a bunch of different angles sometimes, so it's it's kind of hard. But yeah, like getting yourself motivated is generally, I find, at least I think it's easier than trying to get somebody else motivated. Like me telling you guys about stuff that gets me motivated and hopefully it gets you motivated, that's not that hard. But actually making, like if I was there being like, come on, why don't you paint those guys? That's harder, you know what I mean? Especially if it's like a, a husband or wife or some a spouse or family member, then it's hard to be like, come on, do it, you know, because it's, anyway. 
That's what I find. Um, what else? VJ Morph says you can't unmah a meh. Well, that may be the case. Luther Star says starting to get into Gaslands. Any recommendations for motorcycles? Hmm, that's a good question because I have not come across any motorcycles in that scale. You know, like if you were to find, because there's plenty of like eight or 28 millimeter scale motorcycles out there. I mean, Wreckage has got uh, post apocalyptic cool motorcycles. Um, obviously, like 40K has got those big, huge, like almost like crazy Judge Dread giant motorcycles. But motorcycles that are the same scale as Matchbox cars are kind of hard to find. Uh, I have not seen any actually in like in going around and picking up cars for for ga for Gaslands. I have not come across any. So. That's a good question. I don't know. Maybe some people in the chat have got some ideas on that one, but I've not seen any Gasland style motorcycles for sale any place that I can think of, but there's probably some out there. I mean, maybe I wonder if there's some micro machines ones that might work. I don't know. That's a good question. Um Adron, dropping the Google science over here, says Google says that polypropylene, PP, number 5 plastic, is a toxin-free product used in food and beverage containers that is top rack dishwasher safe. Hooray! Now we know. Uh, good, good on you, Adron. Uh, so yeah, if you want to throw this in the top rack, uh, that you can do that. Nice. Um... Giuseppe says, did you ever use actual rust to make rust effect? I mean, put a bunch of steel in a jar with salted water and then use that rusty water. I have not, but Sam has. I don't know if he still does, but when Sam and I first started kind of hanging out together and things like that, he would take steel wool, I think? And it's hard to find steel wool that is that will rust, but you can. And he would have like a little bowl of like water or something and then put a bunch of steel wool in there and let it rust and then he would use that as some kind of rusty pigment in some situations. Um, I've not tried that. I generally, if I'm going to use something, I either fake it with paint or I use a pigment, but I've never actually tried to use real rust, but I know, like I said, Sam has done it before. Um, get your, uh, maybe get over, ask him about it during um, during a Twitch stream and I bet you he can tell you about that more, but yeah. Um, it was it was interesting when he was first doing it. I'm like, huh? It looked gross, you know, because it, it was just like this bowl full of like rusty water with a bunch of steel wool sticking out of the bottom. Um, yeah, uh, we've got a bunch of people here talking about motorcycles for Gasland. That's cool. Storm ten thirty says I paint while watching Andy Griffith. There's a lot of Andy Griffith, so you got a lot of stuff to work with. But that's interesting. All right. Um, let me see here. People talking more about motorcycles. Uh, do, 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 do. Syn Synthoras Alb. I only get to play about twice a month. And I got like eight different systems in my play group. Not getting to play some systems for months really kills my motivation. Um, that's sometimes a problem. I mean, too many game systems. Um, I think that because there are so many different games out there constantly. You know, like, if I sit down and look at the things that I play these days, you know, I bet you've got 40K, though I haven't really played actual 40K in at least six months, if not longer. Um, Age of Sigmar, I haven't played that in a couple of months at least, because my main uh, opponent for Age of Sigmar has been doing a bunch of training in Atlanta. Um, so they got those two, and then Kill Team, enjoying Kill Team still. Uh, wreckage. Um, probably going to miss some. Uh, wanting to get more into Gaslands. I just need to get more people kind of involved around here. Um, and Shadespire. I've been doing some of that and stopped playing X Wing. So I got that one not no longer in the list. Um, honestly, Song of, Song of Blades and Heroes, I, I love it and it's a great teaching game, but I generally only play it now at conventions. Like I take it with me to conventions if I'm going to be running an event. And that's about it. Um, but yeah, I don't uh, generally like those are kind of the ones I've got. But yeah, there's so many other games out there that you can get into, and then you you know you you're right. You do end up in a situation where you're like, well, what are we going to play? And you know, but with skirmish, oh, I forgot about Malifaux, but I haven't played Malifaux in quite some time because uh, it kind of dried up around here. So um, I've still got my units and or my crews painted. I've got 
three. I think I've got three, three, three painted crews. Pretty sure. Um, and that's going to be coming out with a third version of the rules soon. There's going to be Mark three or version three or whatever you want to call it. That'll be coming soon. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's too many games can be difficult, but I'm also not a big fan of only playing one game because that just limits your possibilities. It is problematic in general just because then if something if that and I've talked about this years and years ago I did a video about diversifying your your interests in in wargaming because if like and I think at the time I was talking about 40k because this is again this is back in like 6th edition and if like if you're really unhappy with what the new 7th edition is going to come out with and you don't want to play anymore and that's your only game you're sort of stuck you know what I mean so that was why you know I've always been a big fan of having some diversification if anything, if you're playing in a group and there's a lot of different game systems in there, I would probably look into maybe trying to figure out a schedule so that it's not just like standing around going, well, what should we play? It's just like we know on you know the first week of the month we play this and then the second week of the month we play that and whatever, that kind of thing. So something to take a look at. Um, what else have we got? My mouse is getting all squirrely on me all of a sudden. Let me see. Um... People talking about the scale of Hot Wheels cars. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Adam, I recently got into Blood Bowl with my 10-year-old. Love it. Amazing game. Bought the 2016 edition. I can't find rules for undead necromantic teams. Tips? I don't know if they've got those teams released yet for the new version. Uh, I'm not 100% sure yet. They, do, they have finally just recently released... Um, they released uh, Nurgle teams. I saw those. Those are cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't. I, I've predominantly just stuck with the the stuff that's that's available. I have not tried to kind of go out, you know, outside the outside the boxes that were. Um, but uh, yeah, but Blood Bowl is a cool game. Um, I think, and it is also especially good for for teaching new people into the hobby, whether they're kids or, or whatever. It's also good. It's. I would definitely say it's a gateway game. Certainly. Uh, Randall says everyone is waiting for the third edition of Malifaux. Yeah, I mean it's um, it'll be interesting to see what that does. Uh, you know, when the third edition of War Machine slash Hordes came out, it was kind of met with yawns, from what I understand, from the people who play, and uh, it, that's not a good thing sometimes, especially since I don't know, it, it, that's not great. So uh, hopefully that this is going to be good and make some, some good changes that people like, that the normal player base likes, but also that new people might dig too. So yeah. Um, John Long says, I can't wait for can't wait for Blackstone Fortress. That and the Kickstarter for Resident Evil, the board game, finally comes out next month. Huh. I didn't know there was a board game for Resident Evil. That's interesting. Um Space Iguana says, I'm super excited that AdMech finally got their own video game. Yeah, I'd heard about that, but I haven't like watched any videos or anything about it. I should take a look at it. Um, I want to say, I swear that Wargamer Girl just did a video about it, but I could be wrong. I wonder when she's going to publish the... We did a, a battle report for Kill Team back during uh, Valhalla, back in early October. I wonder when they're going to release that. They spend a lot of time, a lot of time on their on their battle reports. Like their battle reports are, like, pretty high end. It takes them forty plus hours to make a battle report, and so because they do a lot of like overlays and graphics and all kinds of crazy stuff and things like that, specifically for um, War Machine, but you know, or War Machine slash Hordes. But I'm sure that it's gonna, it'll be along the same lines with um, um, the Kill Team one we did in Utah. Um, Brian Griffith says the first unde undead f uh, team for Blood Bowl just in plastic just hit so you could look at those and then you'd have some kind of benefits there so yeah C4 Darkmane says really hoping they do a squat for the Blackstone Fortress that would be kind of cool I would like to see them kind of look back into that I mean as it is in Blackstone Fortress they've got that robot guy who is actually a man of iron, which is to say that he's about 30,000 years old and he's from back during the dark age of technology. He's older than the Imperium, but he is pretending to just be a, like a robot servitor sent by the um, Adeptus Mechanicus. So basically 
he's been just sort of hiding in the shadows and pretending to be like a regular servitor for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but he's actually an AI and completely sentient and the whole deal and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's really interesting because they don't, like they mentioned the dark age of technology, the fluff from time to time, but the fact that this guy's from there, I think is really cool. So maybe they'll also pull a squat or two in and like that and kind of talk about it. Because they actually, if you look in the new 8th edition book, they kind of in the back someplace sort of mention the squats, but they kind of cross it out, but you can still see it, which I think is kind of cool. Um, let me see, what else have we got? Dennis asks, hey Adam, getting into Age of Sigmar, building a corn mortal army around 1,000 points to start. That's a good starting point in my opinion. First time I ever play Warhammer uh, was just a hobby guy before. What's your take on AOS at the moment? Um, I like the new 2.0 rules. I think they're good. Like they've, they've added a little bit and they've kind of thickened it up a little bit, but it's still, I think, pretty accessible as a game. Um, Thousand points, frankly, is what most of the people in my local area, we all like to play thousand points. I know that generally you see more 1500 and 2000 point games, but we like to generally play with thousand points because it's not too big and not too unwieldy, but still works pretty well. There may be some armies that are much more effective at a thousand points than others, but we're also not super competitive. So we're just basically building, it. frankly, we're building what we think is cool, and then, then we kind of go from there and play some games and have some fun. So yeah, if you're trying to get into it from a, um, a more tournament or competitive standpoint, I am not the guy to ask. Um, but yeah, it's something to check out though. It's, it is a very good game. Uh, Space Iguana says, Wargamer World did a video about it, the uh, Mechanicus game, on the channel as a guest, but that was uh, for, the, uh, for the alpha of the, of the game. It changed a little bit in that time frame, but not much, I think. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I did. Like I said, I think I saw because I subscribed to her channel. I think I, I didn't didn't end up watching it, but I remember seeing the the thumbnail come through, and I should I should go back and check it out. Um, back Blackstone Fortress also has two ratlings. Yeah, that's true too. Um, so they, I I think that they're going to have more stuff in there. Hopefully, that's going to be kind of cool that way. What else? Um, do 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 do. Uh, I loved second edition, uh, but stopped playing soon after doing the lack of players. Talking, I'm not sure what that was about. Um, what else have we got? Cut the hand. Uh, we're talking about. Uh, okay, hey Adam, how much bolt action do you still play? Uh, I don't play any. I am getting into Conflict 47, but I don't actually play any bolt action, sadly. Um, how many armies you got? What's your take on the game? Um, I'm still just not quite there with historicals, which is why I'm looking at Conflict 47, which is why I've got an army bought, and I'm, in, I'm slowly working on building it. Um, I really originally hoped to have my Conflict... or I, I wanted to have a thousand points of Conflict 47 done before Valhalla, but then Kill Team came out, and then I got very busy with all of that. So that was a bummer, but it's, it's where it's at. So, um, yeah, I, I like the system, I love the kind of sort of random activation. I love a lot of things about it, um, but just straight up historicals are still just not quite speaking to me. But mostly historicals, but also some laser tanks and some power armor and werewolves, that, that, that's why I like Conflict 47. So um, two of the guys at work both also have Conflict 47 like starter box armies. And so we're one's Japanese, one's British, and then mine's American. And so um, we're gonna we're gonna eventually play, and um, yeah. But it's uh, if anything, that's as close as I'm getting to historicals right now, sadly. So well, it's not sad. It's just I know a lot of people like it a lot. Like a lot of people like historicals. Not as many people as like fantasy and sci-fi. But you know, but it's just I don't know. I still need some fantasy sci-fi in my my um, historicals. It's just because it's a game. I think that's part of the problem. So. Um, let me see. Storm1030 says, Hey Adam, I have a kind of random question off topic. I just used two Corax white spray paint for my towel, and both cans were bad. They literally splayed, sprayed out fine white powder. What white spray would you use? I don't know if this is completely true, but I have always heard that the thing about spray primer is that if it's been sitting on the shelf for a really long time, it can go bad 
pretty quickly. Um, so sometimes if you go to a shop and you buy certain types of spray primer, if you suspect it's been there for a while, it may not work very well. Um, generally for primer, for spray primer, I end up going to the hardware store or the auto parts store in almost all situations. I generally don't use spray primer made by like Citadel or Privateer Press. Um, this, the, 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 color, the, the, the specifically colored stuff from Army Painter, I've had better luck with, but, you know, it depends. Uh, as far as the uh, spray, if you wanted white spray primer, I would try to go to your local auto parts store and find any kind of spray primer, like in white, that is called a sandable auto primer or sandable automobile primer or something like that. I've used black or gray sandable auto primer from, I think the manufacturer's Duplicolor, and I've loved that stuff. They also make like a red oxide, like a dark red, which has also been very useful in certain situations. But if you can find a white sandable auto primer, those are inexpensive, usually five, six bucks a can, and they do work quite nice on models. Um, and a lot of times the auto parts stores, because they have more traffic than a game store, the paints have a tendency to rotate through more quickly, so you know, you've got a better chance. But in any situation with any kind of spray that you're about to put on a model, um, I always try it on something else first, even if it's just a piece of sprue or just spray it onto a piece of cardboard or something like that and see what it does. Um, the upside is that if the primer comes out real like powdery, it's in more situations than not just something you can actually just brush off of the model or you could just wash it real quick in the sink and it'll all come off because it won't stick to the model. You're right. It'll come out literally like powder. So yeah, that's kind of the deal. Um, let me see here. Kelly asks, Hey Adam, even though I don't play much, I find that Malifaux painting is the perfect trade-off after doing GW kill teams for a while. Do you still paint minis for games you don't play? I want to. Um, lately I've been trying to get so much work done for stuff that I need for the channel. I haven't done that as much. Um, so yeah, Lord knows I've got enough stuff I've got to get done to actually play with. But I do definitely, like I did buy at Gen Con this year, I bought a Malifaux model just because I thought it looked amazing. And I don't even remember actually which faction it's for, but I do want to paint it and, and use it for something. Um, I do want to do a display piece at some point, maybe in this upcoming year in 2019. And I want to use the big orc like Mega Boss from Age of Sigmar, that big huge orc and all that that crazy armor, and he's got that big dragon skull on his shoulder. I picked one of him up, and I want to have him standing like on a, a battlefield across from some other like human or potentially even halfling warrior, just to kind of get the dichotomy of size. Um, and um, yeah, so I do I do have that interest area, but right now, like in the past, literally since July, I've been nonstop just painting stuff I need for bat reps and things like that. Um, yeah, I haven't painted anything for display or just because I want to do it, but I do have things kind of set aside for that. So I still do want to do it. I just haven't gotten to that point yet. So yeah. Alistair asks... Do you think GW will phase out the now short Space Marines and eventually replace all units with Primaris? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if they will ever... They will... I would... Hmm. I would be very surprised if they finally just said, look, there are no more TAC Marines. You know, like the normal size Space Marines, one wound. Um, that being said, I could see if they don't make too many new ones. Like, I could see them not sculpting new ones. Like, let's say, if there's an 8th or ninth edition, uh, let's say there's another edition that comes out. I don't think they're going to try to put the editions to get together so quickly like they have in the past. Like, the difference the, between 4th and 5th was a long time. Between 5th and 6th was even kind of a long time. But between 6th and 7th was an incredibly short period of time for editions of, of 40k. I think that we're going to stick at 8th for a while. Um, especially now that they can do the um, uh, chapter approved, where they can basically kind of snap on extra stuff and like tweak things. Um, so we may stick at 8th for a while. That all being said, if a new codex down the road did come out for Space Marines and they decided to go with a whole bunch of new Space Marine stuff, I would be sort of surprised to see a lot of, or even some, regular-sized Space Marines. I think that the Primaris... 
the primaris will probably be where they focus for a while but they'll probably still with using the molds that they already have still crank out regular tac marines and stuff like that because people still buy that stuff i mean when it gets down to it when i decided to build my space marine army um i went all primaris partially because i already had the starter box for eighth edition and that's full of primaris but also just i don't know they're two wounds you know i mean that's kind of nice and then you don't have to paint as many of them so that's also kind of nice um so yeah that's kind of where that's at CD, CD, or C4 Dark Main says, I think by 10th edition, regular 40k Marines will have gone. Oh, that maybe. That's possible. I don't know. Pop Burns, says, how often do new 40k editions come out? Oh, that's kind of the thing. Like I said, it used to be a good long time in between, and then there was a very short period of time between 6th and 7th. Maybe two years. And I thought maybe that's going to be the new normal. They're going to come out with it every two years. But then when the the regime change at Games Workshop and Tom Kirby was out and now Kevin Roundtree was in and they've started doing all these things better and paying more attention and doing all that stuff. And then 8th edition came out and people really liked it. I don't think they're going to jump to a 9th edition anytime soon. Especially, like I said, because of um, the chapter approved books that you'll be able to buy that they put out every year. You just buy another chapter approved book. It adds new stuff. It tweaks things, change points, costs, things like that. So you don't have to crank out a new book. Um, but we'll see. I, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, Storm ten thirty says, "I wish they would up also. I wish they would update the Chaos Space Marines so they will be taller, not short like a guardsman. Also, make more customizable Chaos Cultists." Yes, I agree with that too. Um, I have a suspicion that at some point they may come out with new Chaos stuff, and that new Chaos stuff will look a little bit more like the Chaos stuff that was in not Dark Imperium but Dark Vengeance, the previous starter. You know how like those models were were bigger. I think they are going to phase out the regular, current, very old Chaos Space Marine uh, kit, and they're going to come up with some new stuff. I mean, if you just look at the Death Guard, how much taller they are, then, you know, they're not Primaris, and they're still just the one wound, but they're nicer looking, better models. And I think eventually they will do that, maybe for regular Chaos Space Marines and for Berserkers. That'd be real nice, because the Berserker models are also crazy old. So, we'll see. Um... Joe Mo says, not sure if I'm saying this right, but I kind of liked it the old way when your head was at an angle to the screen. Seemed easier to watch somehow, but I might get used to it. Yeah, I mean, it's a different angle. It's the Things are different here. Um, I, and I'm still kind of messing with it. Um, I like the visual. It's maybe a little bright now. I've got to figure out something to do with the shades maybe. Uh, so I'm getting a little blown out over here if I was to kind of block this light over here. Anyway, so it's, it's in progress. And uh, like I said, it's also... I may try a different lens. I may try something. I was talking about this yesterday in the Patreon show. I may try like a wide angle lens and then I'll be able to get the camera closer, but then I will get a little bit more fisheye. Like my nose might get bigger and that kind of stuff. I might look like a, like a Buster Rhymes video from the 90s, you know? I'll put on one of those big puffy jackets. I technically have a, it's not that puffy, but it's a little puffy. Um, and I could do that. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's in progress. But I, I mean, guys, I literally... Yesterday got a wild hair before the 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 live show for, for the patrons and it was like I'm gonna make this try to work and uh, and I did a little bit of research and then I sort of got it to work and then I messed with it and and then did a bunch of adjusting and then did the live show yesterday they were kind of the guinea pigs um, so shout out to the irregulars and um, for for helping me out with that and then uh, it's worked out pretty well now I will admit when I turned it on this morning um, the camera screen that I can see over there that sticks off the camera looked great but the screen down here was super crazy dark like all you could see was like the lightest points and I was like ah oh. so I had to go into the settings which for some reason in the settings in the software I use XSplit had just been like oh we're just going to turn the darkness and the contrast all the way down no idea why I had to just go back in and tell it to get better and then it did so it's it's a learning process we're, we're it's I'm working on it um let me see. Chris M. Collecting says, Great stream. Thanks for taking time to, to do it. Well, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Adron says, Nick isn't looking so hot in the current setup. I mean, he's currently like kind of blown out because of the, the sun has come out now. So what's the temperature? Oh, it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit. So that'll be, that's something. Um, Mr. Dorv says, really love the Death Guard models. Did my first one using the Space Wolf color scheme, and I'm pretty happy with the results. Interesting. Huh. 
Yeah, that's kind of cool. I could see that. Corvus Games Terrain says, Hey, or, no, how long does the Patreon show run for? I generally try to run it about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, maybe an, sometimes almost as much as two hours, but usually about at least an hour and 45 minutes. Um, Corvus Games Terrain, hey, how you doing? I did receive the package. I stopped, um, you'd sent me a package full of, um, well, first of all, there were some potato chips, which were lovely. I had those actually uh, after the show yesterday uh, for lunch. Um, and then, uh, but then there was also a bunch of 3D printed ter terrain, which I have not even gotten a chance to completely pull out and, 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 and look at all of it. But the stuff is very cool. But I did receive the package, it showed up. I stopped at my P.O. box uh, on Friday after work, so it did get here. Um, for those of you who are interested in sending some stuff, oh, that was bad. Um, anyway, uh, the camera, uh, good point. Hang on, let me fix that real quick. But if you look there, you'll see that it is, uh, the address is Tabletop Means 2080 West 9th Avenue, uh, number 331, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54904. And I need to be there, and then I need to be there, there. There we go. Anyway, yeah, so Tabletop Minions, 2080, 2080 West 9th Avenue, three, th number 331, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54904. So, yeah, that, um, yeah, I, I'll, yeah, I'll definitely take a look at the terrain. It looks really great. It's a bunch of really cool 3D printed stuff from Corvus, and, um, and yeah, it, it's post-apocalyptic stuff. Really glad to see it. And um, also those chips were lovely. What else? Where are we at here? Um, in between pretzels and beer and 40K, it's a, Lane says, uh, in between pretzels and beer and 40K is a good analogy. When I saw it appear on their website, it was definitely, uh, I mostly play Age of Sigmar. I think I missed the first part of that, but that's okay. Um, Synthoris asks, is that a guitar in the back? No, that is my wife's uh, cello case. Uh, she plays the cello. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, oh, Corvus asks, how was the chocolate? I haven't, eat the ch haven't tried the chocolate yet. My wife is very interested, though. Let me see here. Um, Space Iguana. I had to learn where Oshkosh was last week for my... Jude board, J O O D. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, oh, it's something in the Coast Guard. Uh, yeah, Oshkosh is um, it's in kind of the middle-ish part of Wisconsin, and we're on the shores of Lake Winnebago, which is a, a good-sized lake. You can usually see it on the globe if you look at a globe of the Earth or whatever. I mean, it's not a great lake. You know, it's it's a it's an okay lake. Um, absolutely. Nibble Cookie, that's a pretty good name, says, As a Tyranid player, the idea of them phasing out old kits scares me. Uh, I don't think that Tyranids are going anywhere. Um, I think that the reason that we were talking before about tactical marines being eventually phased out is because they have a replacement, which is the Primaris marines. Um, there's potentially... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that... I think it would be a dumb business move. It's getting real bright, isn't it? <laughs> I think it would get. I think it would be a very dumb business move for uh, them and them being Games Workshop to phase out parts of an army, unless the army just wasn't selling. Like if an army's not selling, then I could see them, you know, doing that. Like they kind of did that with um, Black Templars. Black Templars used to have their own codex that was separate from the Space Marine codex. They had their own like upgrade kit box and all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden one day they were just like, well, we're just going to fold it into. Um, you know, the regular Space Marine Codex. If you want to do Black Templars, that's cool, but that's on you. We're not going to make it a separate thing. But I think it's because the parts weren't selling and there wasn't as much stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there's something to be said about consolidating for business purposes and all that kind of jazz. So, definitely. Uh, maybe your wife can compose an intro on the cello for special episodes. She's not a big con uh, composer. She doesn't. She's more of a player, not a composer. At least from what she's told me. So yeah, I don't know if that will happen. But I could maybe find something cool and then she could play it. That might be kind of cool. Uh, let me see there here. Oshkosh also has a lot of military industry ties to it. That's probably why um, it's in your J-O-O-D qualification. Yeah, that's true. We uh, have the Oshkosh Corporation who makes um, military Jeep type things. The M-A-T-V, I think it's called, which is kind of the replacement for the Humvee. Um, 
the Humvee has a very flat bottom, and as it runs over IEDs, it's bad, obviously. Whereas the the MATV is a big, huge, crazy Jeep type vehicle thing, but it has a bottom on it that's like this, so that when stuff explodes, it shoots it out and not up into the people. So um, yeah, that's um, Oshkosh Corporation's a big a big uh, employer here in the area. All right, well, it looks like the sun has come out like crazy, and it's 11 p.m. or a.m. Sorry, it's 11 a.m. here uh, in 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 the hinterland, and so I want to thank everybody for coming to the show and uh, and and chit chatting and saying hi. I'm going to have to figure out a little bit about what to do about when the light changes quite a bit because I've got everything set manually right now. The focus isn't changing because I hate that kind of when it's constantly hunting, which the the webcam would do from time to time, would like try to find the focus area. But I got to figure out something a little bit better for the, um, hmm, maybe I'll use the ISO and set that on auto. Anyway, uh, it, thanks for being the second wave of guinea pigs with this new camera thing here on the show. And thanks for coming by and uh, and hanging out and stuff like that. And, oh, Matthew Sears is going to play some Fallout 76 after he takes out the trash. All right, well, we'll have to talk a little bit about that maybe. So anyway, um, yeah, that's where we're at. So uh, we'll see you hopefully in two weeks. And um, if you're in the America area, you have a good Thanksgiving coming up this week. And if you're not, just have a good Thursday. You know, it's pretty good. So um, and we'll see you in a couple of two weeks. And um, thanks for watching.